All right, well, um, I'll try to uh, present to you some ideas about from natural rights towards or to nature's rights. Uh, now, by training, I am both a lawyer and an intellectual historian. So I have a tendency to put forward kind of the sequence of ideas which I think connect one with another and so on. In legal terms, that means uh, that I am perhaps uh, better uh, suited to develop an argument in customary international law uh, than most of my other colleagues in the legal field. Uh, a lot of you per perhaps are not familiar uh, that continental Europe, uh, and especially the former communist countries, who for a very, very long time uh, did not recognize customer international law as part of international law. Uh, that was a special work uh, of uh, G.I. Tunkin from Moscow to keep them pure from various changes taking place in the rest of the world. At the same time, uh, Europe, which, is, uh, which was the home for the development of customary law, and especially customary international law, which came from uh, Hugo Grotius, uh, uh, the Dutch uh, international lawyer, has somehow relinquished its grasp of customary international law, and therefore they tend to look at treaties or in the civil law tradition of trying to interpret what exa phrases exactly mean. And in that process, progress is nowhere to be found because we are only looking at treaties or something which is clearly there. You're not looking at the direction or the path uh, uh, through which the law changes. That uh, initiative in that particular area was taken away by Americans at the beginning of the 20th century. And American government is perhaps the most successful government in using customary international law to get what it wants. Well, just like 1982 Law of the Sea Convention, Reagan said, I don't recognize it, and then issues a statement from the State Department that we recognize everything except Part 11 of the Convention uh, as customary international law. And they don't sign the treaty, they don't ratify it. A technical European lawyer thinks that maybe America is not a party to it. And therefore we cannot enforce those things in America. But the fact is, customary international law is often superior to treaty law, uh, which has been uh, confirmed in uh, a case called North Sea Continental Shelf Cases by the International Court of Justice in the 70s. So it's a very interesting uh, scenario we face. Uh, Europe, continental Europe, still believing. You, you probably know about your Hungary, Slovakia, Dan case, uh, Gapsko, Dan case. Uh, interestingly, I was teaching at CEU at that time. Uh, when the case was decided. And, and, and soon after that, I went to Hague, met with one of the judges, uh, Rosalind Higgins, and I told her, she was not one of those who wrote the judgment. I said, the lawyers hired by Hungary missed a great opportunity to protect the environment through customary international law. Same lawyers have been engaged to protect whales. God help them. The case is pending before the International Court. And that was the reason why Hungary, because they were interpreting treaty. They failed 
to mention even once that track of customary international law which would have placed precautionary principle as customary international law. Of course it was principle of international law, but that doesn't mean it is enforceable. That means it is enforceable only in the context of a treaty. But when it comes to custom, it is enforceable irrespective of the treaty. Because once you recognize a principle at higher level, mur for example, murder is a murder. Whether you murder a child, or you murder a woman, or you murder a man of white or black or yellow color, it is still a murder. So once you accept that concept is at that level, it is totally different ballgame. And that is what the, my scholarly colleague from Cambridge, uh, James Crawford, and your Hungarian uh, origin lawyer from France, uh, Professor Kish, failed to do that at the International Court. And that is why I always say, please look at the intellectual history of an idea so that you can build an argument in custom, so that you can elevate it to a higher level. Now, that is what I'm, I'll try quickly, because we have a very long list here. This is, my effort is only to uh, chronicle relevant ideas in brief, and I hope that it will take us in the right direction. Uh, the path of natural rights, especially with regard to humans, started in 1215 by enactment of Magna Carta in Britain. Now, that was an ethical movement to recognize uh, that people do have some kinds of rights, not only the kings. And it was 500 years later that Magna Carta was declared uh, as a representative of natural rights. This uh, shift uh, took place by uh, Locke, who in his uh, treatise on uh, two government uh, in the 17th century uh, tried to argue in favor of life, liberty, limb, and property or possessions. That was his uh, position and that is uh, what went from John Locke to other, uh, the, the English Revolution of 1868 first. And he also recommended that in order to protect these rights, society ought to have a government. And he also rec uh, recognized that right to revolution has to be recognized. Otherwise, the governments can become tyrannical and very controlling and start denying your rights. Uh, so it was an interesting exercise and, and all the first time uh, he recommends a proper government by people. For, this was followed by the, the U.S. Declaration of Independence in 1776. Now, the U.S. Declaration of Independence uh, is lauded a lot uh, that we all are born equal. Uh, yet uh, the women and, and the people of color were not. Uh, there is no mention of that there. It took a civil war in 1870 for the black people to get <coughs> partial rights, whereas the female uh, the women got rights in 1920 and the American Indians got rights in 1924. Uh, it doesn't mean that they all are enjoying them. As you can see from a current case in Miami of a shooting of a young uh, teenager, there is still a problem. Uh, the problems of enforcement remain uh, even after 200 years, uh, 250 years now of American um, uh, constitution and guarantees of rights. But all the rights were not spelled in that uh, uh, Declaration of Independence. What is interesting is uh, why we moved away from just natural rights to uh, anthropocentric or human-centered uh, rights. If we look at the Roman law, before 
the arrival of Christianity, or just around that time, it clearly recognizes <laughs> animal rights. Uh, Ulpain, in third century, considers all kinds of animals as part of uh, the legal system and that they should be protected as much as the humans. The Roman law's origin were, it was a codified um, civil law court of Ulpain, uh, but their origins were in the case law of uh, common law, common law case law coming from um, Byzantium uh, as well as all the way up to uh, Levna, uh, which legal historians can probably point out more accurately how uh, it evolved, but it's very clear that at that stage, until the arrival of so-called dominance of Abrahamic religions, there was no distinction between the rights of humans and non-humans. This distinction starts from the Genesis. That is where it is clearly spelled out. Go ahead, multiply, and enjoy everything it is for you. So that's, that is a cultural problem. That problem was brought from Middle East, planted in the psychology far west. Uh, it was also carried to far east. Uh, if we look at the place of uh, animals in the Indian um, way of life or of philosophy. I am very hesitant to call any Indian uh, thing a religion. Because if we say, maybe we have tons of religions there. They are, none of them is a religion. They are all way of life. Uh, the invention of so-called Hinduism, the word Hindu was derived from Indus River after the arrival of Greeks. Uh, Alexander, and that is when this whole coinage uh, started. Uh, but if we look at the, the Indian philosophy before that, the Vedic philosophy, what it is, is it is a totally monotheistic uh, a way of life to live in harmony with natural elements. We cannot exist without water, air, trees, plants, and therefore each and every element has its place and it must be recognized and respected. That is what the Vedic way of life was. And that was pointed out again by Buddha. By the way, Buddha, I'm sure some of you know, he is and was an atheist. So what he's trying to point out is how to live happily in harmony with various elements of nature respecting all other animals, the, the day Buddha left or decided to talk about animals was when he went out uh, first time with his cousin on a hunting trip and his cousin fired an arrow at a swan. And Buddha, whose name was Siddharth, he saw the swan and he felt very, very sad. He took out the arrow, he nurtured the swan back to health and then that day he decided we have no right to take the life of other uh, creatures and, and cause pain and suffering to these animals. That was how he converted. That is why he left home and in search of event in search of truth. So these are cultural issues. These cultural issues get entangled in the name of religion and then nobody wants to touch them, dares to touch them. You never try that in southern states of the United States. You know, they are all evangelical Christians. They all believe in uh, Genesis. And if you try to tell them, don't do this, you have no right to kill animals, they'll kill you. Uh, so, there are problems in culture and they should be addressed through culture. And we will see that they have been addressed through culture. In uh, Britain, 
in Europe, uh, uh, there was one more great uh, thinker who contributed a great deal to the pain and suffering of animals, and that was uh, Descartes. Uh, I don't know where his intellectual uh, faculties went when he decided to say that animals are like machines and they make noise like machines. And they, we can nail them and dissect them without giving any um, sedation. Uh, uh, that was uh, horrible. And I don't know what happened to Grotius, who was such a brilliant legal scholar, developed argument in customary law. Uh, he sided with with uh, uh, Descartes, along with Pufendra. Uh, so, a lot of these great thinkers, they give us something good and something sometimes very awful. And it takes a collecti collective uh, effort of uh, people uh, to, to change the direction. After these things, in 1641, we see in Massachusetts, United States, the first time they passed a law uh, to, put, uh, to uh, stop uh, crim criminal behavior against animals and to protect them from cruelty. Uh, Lux, uh, 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 Locke was followed in Britain by many other uh, writers, philosophers, uh, even poets, Henry Moore, Leibniz, uh, Spinoza, Alexander Pope, and Charles Darwin, who thoroughly disagreed with Descartes. And it didn't end there. I mean, this is from 17th to 19th century. And then we have in uh, 1789, Jeremy Bentham, the father of utilitarianism, uh, who went on, who was very, very much against this taking away of the rights from uh, non-human uh, creatures. And he said, the day may come when the rest of the animal creation may acquire those rights, which never could have been withholden from them. And he was very firm, and he was referring, obviously, to old Roman law. Uh, his uh, so-called disciple, John Stuart Mill, uh, was asked to become vice president of the Royal Society for the uh, prevention of cruelty to animals, which was created uh, in the 18th century. And he refused to do that. He said, as long as other patrons continue to hunt and kill fox, I am not going to join it. Uh, so there were these great thinkers who did lay a lot of foundation and uh, did a great work uh, in directing uh, our behavior and trying to change. Now what they are trying to change is they are trying to change that thinking instilled and drilled by the Old Testament. That's what they were struggling against. They were trying to take us back to the Roman law uh, times of natural law. Now this uh, humanitarian uh, thought, which evolved over three, four hundred, five hundred years, has helped develop an environmental ethics. And out of it came the human rights part, again, separating human from uh, the nat natural rights. Although we claim, as Locke said, the human rights are natural rights. So there is a linkage. Human rights are natural rights, and they become rights of men. Uh, and that is what was adopted in the French Revolution. It was, uh, uh, l lately it has been found that Adam Smith uh, was uh, corresponding with Condorcet in France and, and uh, with other French revolutionaries, and the ideas of Locke were being transmitted to French revolutionaries uh, uh, in, in great amount, and that is what influenced them. Uh, Jefferson, the American president later, was American ambassador in France at the time of revolution, and he took all those ideas back to America, not at the independence time, declaration of independence is 25 years before the, the, the drafting of the American Constitution, and, and after the American Constitution was drafted, there were no rights there. It was all in the amendments. And that was the doing of Jefferson, who took it back. So we see there is a chain, there is passing of ideas uh, moving from one place to another. Uh, it happened between Britain, France, and um, US. Uh, and then we see uh, some other problems in US, where, uh, in Europe, where uh, human rights 
were didn't exist. Uh, now that is pre World War Two. Uh, they didn't exist. They didn't exist in the Germanic legal system because of Hegel, and that's what Marx read. So they didn't exist, and that is what was transmitted to Russians. They didn't exist. Not until after the Second World War, when the Basic Law of Germany was drafted under the American uh, guidance, that's when they started to enter again. Now all you, of your new Central and Eastern European country constitutions have human rights placed in the constitution. Uh, your probably criminal laws have been amended in order to provide for proper procedure of due process and so on. However, have we matured to provide human rights to all people? I don't think so. Otherwise, there was European Court of Human Rights would not have such a heavy load of cases coming from each and every one of the European countries. One more minute left. Sorry, one more minute left. Okay, thank you. Uh, that is a clear indication that we can have laws on paper in constitutions, but unless and until we change our culture, we will not succeed. That is what comes down to the nature and natural rights. Now, I'll give you a very quick uh, rundown of <coughs> how these uh, expanding concept of rights, they expanded from Magna Carta to uh, uh, American documents, slaves, women, Native American laborers. Well, America is very backward when it comes to laborers. Germany is far ahead of them. Blacks and then uh, Endangered Species Act. Uh, evolution of the same thing in the environmental ethics, self, family, tribe, present situation, nation, race, humans, animals halfway through, and the future what we are expecting according to Nash is plants, life, uh, rocks, ecosystems, planet, and universe. I think his classification need to be readjusted because ecosystem has already found a firm ground in international environmental law. Uh, and I have written uh, uh, on them uh, in 1989 and then again in 1996. This is when I was in CEU. Uh, they are firmly placed in international law. This sequence is not accurate. Uh, but this is what we have to do is to move in the direction of changing human consciousness to recognize we are part of nature not nature was made for us to go and destroy. Thank you.